हाई एवरीबडी वेलकम टू मै यूट्यूब चानल डॉक्टर श्रीनिवास मेडिकल कॉन्सेप्ट एंड मै एफ बी पेज डॉक्टर श्रीनिवास कॉन्सेप्ट दिस इज डॉक्टर श्रीनिवास न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट फ्रॉम आंध्र प्रदेश इंडिया आई एम ऑलसो दि मेडिकल ऑथर ऑफ द बुक फोकस्ड न्यूरोलॉजी टूडे वील टॉक अबाउट अ वेरी कॉमन कंप्लेट बैक एग एंड नेक पेन mainly in terms of disc prolapse and its treatment so back pain is a very common complaint and we need to know a lot about back pain so as to approach it easily and treat accordingly but before we go and try to understand back ache and neck pain especially in terms of disc prolapse we need to know certain concepts the two fundamental concepts are about the roots there are eight cervical roots but there are only seven cervical vertebrae because of this there's a discrepancy between the root exit and the vertebral body we have c7 vertebral bodies and c8 cervical roots the first cervical root goes above c1 the second cervical root goes above the corresponding vertebral body that is c2 the third cervical root goes above the respective vertebral body that is the third vertebral body so up to seven cervical roots they go above the respective vertebral bodies but when it comes to c8 there is no c7 so it goes above t1 and now the t1 root goes below t1 the t2 root goes below t2 vertebral body and the t3 root goes below the respective t3 vertebral body so c7 cervical roots go above the respective vertebral bodies and c8 cervical root and below the respective roots go below their respective vertebral bodies so c7 roots above c8 roots they go above the respective vertebral bodies c8 and below the roots go below their respective vertebral bodies and therefore if there's a disc prolapse between c5 and c6 since the c6 root goes above c6 it is the c6 root which gets affected that is the root corresponding to the lower most vertebral body which gets affected but when it comes to lumbar disc prolapse what happens the root goes below the respective vertebral body for example L5 root goes below L5. So when the L5 S1 there's a disc prolapse, the L5 should get affected. But usually the L5 root goes laterally, and therefore it is the S1 root which gets affected. So in L5 S1 disc prolapse, though the L5 roots root goes between the L5 and S1, since it emerges laterally, it is usually the S1 root which gets affected. so finally based on these two concept whether it is cervical disc prolapse or lumbar disc prolapse the exiting root which gets affected is the root which corresponds to the lower vertebral body so if it is c5 c6 it is the c6 root which gets affected if it is l5 s1 it is the s1 root which gets affected but if the disc prolapses medially downstream roots get affected s1 then s2 s3 s4 the more medially it goes so these two are very important this uh, this concept is a very important concept based on these two we we find out the root which gets affected according to the disc prolapse right the second point is that the spinal cord ends at the level of l1 the spinal cord ends at the level of l1 therefore the spinal cord segments and the vertebral bodies don't correspond because the spinal cord ends at l1 the spinal cord and the vertebral bodies do not correspond the t10 corresponds to l1 l2 t11 to l3 t12 to l5 s1 and l1 all the sacral and coccygeal segments emerge so l1 the spinal cord ends so below l1 it at l1 the sacral and coccygeal segments are seen so the spinal cord and the vertebral body do not correspond this gives us a very important concept when there is a cervical disc prolapse both the spinal cord both the spinal cord and the roots get affected so if there is a cervical disc prolapse both the spinal cord and the roots get affected 
but it is the, if it is a lumbar disc prolapse, since the spinal cord ends at the level of L1, if there is a lumbar disc prolapse, the spinal cord does not get affected because the spinal cord ends at the level of L1. It is only the roots which get affected. So cervical disc prolapse, both the spinal cord and the roots get affected. Whereas if it is lumbar disc prolapse, only the roots get affected and the cord does not get affected. So these two are very important concepts. And before we go into the disc prolapse details, we need to understand certain anatomy, anatomical points. So if we see from posterior to anterior, the posterior most point is the spine. And the spinal cord is well protected, protected between the spine and the vertebral body which lies anterior. So from the spinal cord emerges the roots, the dorsal root and the ventral root. So if there is a disc prolapse between the bodies, if it is a central disc prolapse, the spinal cord gets affected. If it is a lateral disc prolapse, the root gets affected. You can see in the sagittal section, the body, between the bodies are the intervertebral disc. Intervertebral disc forms almost a 1 for 25% of the total length of the column. So when the disc prolapses, it goes and hits on the spinal cord or the emerging roots. Then we have the transverse, we have the spinous process at the back. I will talk about it during surgery, but here I need to just mention that when there is a disc prolapse, we either do, we do a discectomy, discectomy or decompression where we take the disc out or stabilization, that is the fusion of the bony fragment, that is the spine. So these are the two types of treatment which we offer a person suffering from disc prolapse. So again, coming back, this is the axial section, you can see the body, you can see the spinous process and the transverse process. You have the lamina and the pedicle. The lamina and pedicle becomes important, especially we can do laminectomy and take and approach the disc. And we have the pedicle which connects the anterior part with the posterior part. Right. But what exactly is the disc prolapse and what is the pathophysiology? The disc is a soft structure which lies between the vertebral bodies and I said earlier it corresponds almost to 25% of the length of the spinal canal spinal cord. The intervertebral disc has got two parts, the center nucleus pulposus, the inner nucleus pulposus and the outer annulus fibrosus. The nucleus pulposus has got a good high water content. So when we are young, it has got a good water content. But as we become older and when we get aged, the soft and gelatinous disc becomes hard and dry as we age because the water goes out. So normally in young people there is a disc is very good it acts as a shock absorber and the disc prolapse is very minimal in young people because the disc contains a good amount of water and it is of good height but as we become older the water goes out of the nucleus pulposus so it becomes dry compressed heart and the disc prolapses. Therefore, disc prolapse is usually a disease of older people. Right. Now, what exactly causes disc prolapse? One, excessive weight. When there is excessive weight, it there is an immense pressure on the disc and a disc tends to prolapse. So, excessive weight or poor posture or a decrease in muscle strength because of lack of exercise. When we exercise, the muscles strengthen up and therefore it holds on to the disc and does not allow it to prolapse. But when there is a lack of exercise, the muscle weakens and the disc easily prolapses. So lack of exercise, excessive weight and, and abnormal postures and especially in women because of osteoporosis, postmenopausal osteoporosis, a decrease in calcium. All these things can be can be uh, uh, factors, precipitating factors for intervertebral disc prolapse. So, when the disc gets weakened because of the egress of water, the height, the normal disc height becomes less. Normally, it appears white on MRI because of the water content, but when the disc degenerated degenerates, the water egresses out, so the white color of the disc now becomes black 
and the normal height of the disc is lost, it becomes compressed. So when we do MRI, the interval disc appears black because there is no water and it gets compressed. So what exactly happens in intervertebral disc, the nucleus pulposus breaks through the annulus fibrosus and lies outside the disc in the spinal canal and this impinges on the root. So the nucleus pulposus breaks out and comes of the, out of the annulus pulposus and if it impinges laterally, it impinges on the nerve. If it goes medially, it impinges on the cord. So how do we, how do we diagnose it on MRI? On MRI, the normal disc is white in color and it is of good height because of good water content. But as we get age, the water egresses out. So it appears black on MRI and it appears compressed. So the moment you see compressed and black colored disc, you know it's a disc prolapse. So another important concept is that normally we say when we talk about disc prolapse, we say cervical disc prolapse or lumbar disc prolapse. We don't say as thoracic disc prolapse. Why disc prolapse is not common in thoracic regions? Because of two region, reasons. One, the disc prolapse is because of excessive mobility. Because of mobility, there is excessive wear and tear, degenerative changes and disc prolapse appears easily. Because we keep moving neck up, flexion, extension, sideways, rotation, because of this excessive mobility, there are degenerative changes and there is disc prolapse in the cervical region. Likewise, in the lumbar region also, we bend forwards, we bend backwards, we turn this way, that way. Because of this excessive mobility, again there is degenerative change and lumbar disc prolapse appears easily. But in thoracic region, we hardly move our thorax. Because we hardly move our thorax, there is less mobility and, this, and there is less chance of degeneration and therefore there is less chance of thoracic disc prolapse. And another reason is that the thorax is well protected because of rib cage. Because of the rib cage which gives an additional protection and because of less mobility of thoracic area, the thoracic disc prolapse is less common. So we see disc prolapse more in the cervical regions and the lumbar regions. So when the cervical spine, there is a disc prolapse, what happens? If it goes laterally, it impinges on the roots causing cervical radiculopathy. But if the disc prolapse, if it is centrally placed, it impinges on the cord and causes myelopathy. Sometimes it can be a posterior lateral, central and centrolateral causing myeloradiculopathy. Whereas if there is a lumbar disc prolapse, since the spinal cord ends at the L1 and since the disc prolapse is more common at L5, S1, it is only the roots which get affected. The cord cannot get affected because the cord ends at the level of L1. So after L1 it, has, it is only roots, the horse tail cord equina. So if there is a lumbar disc prolapse, only there is radiculopathy. But if there is a cervical disc prolapse, there could be both radiculopathy as well as myelopathy. So treatment. So how do we treat a person suffering from disc prolapse? It is surprising to know that 80% of the time, the disc prolapse heals on its own. Whether we give conservative treatment, surgical treatment or no treatment at all, the disc prolapse heals on its own 80% of the time even without treatment. So mainly the treatment for disc prolapse is conservative. Surgical role is very very minimal. So 80% of the time, this can heal on its own. Right. So what we do? As I said earlier, excessive weight, we should ask the person to reduce weight. We should ask the person to maintain good posture. We should ask them to exercise a lot so that the muscle strengthens and we can give calcium tablets also. If there is a severe pain and disc prolapse, we ask them to take rest only for a couple of days. And after that, we advise them to go for non-weight bearing simple exercises like walking because it helps to it helps the muscles the spinal cord to rejuvenate better when we when we ask them to mobilize without giving rest for a long duration of time and therefore we advise rest if there's a severe pain only for a couple of days and then we ask them to perform uh, non weight bearing exercises like walking and of course we should not ask them to bend or cause excessive mobility especially the flexion movements which will make the uh, disc prolapse
to get worsened. The medical treatment, as I said, the main treatment is conservative. The medical treatment involves medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, COX-2 inhibitors, steroids, which can be given oral, or if there is severe pain, we can give injectable steroids at the level of the disc prolapse, which reduces inflammation and swelling. We can also give muscle relaxants like, like baclofen, diazepam, we can give opioids if there is severe pain. Once the severe pain comes down in a matter of few days, we can advise them to undergo physiotherapy. We can ask them to massage the muscles or we can give, uh, we can give cold, cold, uh, cold sponges where we reduce the temperature so that the inflammation comes down or we ask them to have heat treatment where it reduces muscle pain. We can, once the pain subsides, we can ask the persons to undergo muscle strengthening exercises once the pain subsides. As I said earlier, when I began my lecture, I said, we see disc prolapse in the cervical region and the lumbar region because of excessive mobility, there is wear and tear and excessive degeneration. And therefore, the principle of treatment is to reduce mobilization, immobility or immobilization of the neck and back. So how do, how do we immobilize the neck or back? Give them cervical collar, soft or hard, or lumbosacral belt, so that the mobilization of the neck or back comes down. So cervical and lumbar traction, cervical and lumbar collar, and then we ask them to undergo cervical traction or lumbar traction. It stretches the core and takes off the pressure on the nerve. So we can ask them to undergo cervical traction or lumbar traction, by cervical traction we over lumbar traction we are stretching the cord and taking off the pressure on the nerves and uh, one very fascinating treatment of pain i told in one of my earlier lectures on pain the gateway theory of pain what is the gateway theory of pain when the large fibers are stimulated that is position joint vibration sense those fibers that is a posterior column are stimulated it blocks the pain impulses carried by the small fibers, the spinothalamic tract, pain and temperature. So when large fibers posterior column is stimulated, it closes the gate for transmission of pain impulses along the small fibers, the spinothalamic tract. So we can give spinal cord stimulation where we stimulate the posterior column, the large fibers, thereby blocking the gate of entry of pain impulses through the small fibers that is the spinal thalamic tract, the spinal cord stimulation. So these are all the these are all the medical forms of treatment of liver, uh, lumbar disc prolapse or cervical disc prolapse. By and large, the treatment for disc prolapse is only medical. But then, what are the surgical aspects? Surgery. We, as I said earlier, I re I emphasize that the treatment for cervical lumbar disc prolapse is only medical. But there are certain indications where we can ask the person to undergo surgery. One, the involvement of bubble and bladder. When the bubble and bladder is involved or when there is severe excruciating pain or when there is severe weakness. So when there is bubble and bladder disturbances or severe pain or severe weakness. But even of these three indications, the most important indication for surgery and perhaps the only and seriously considered indication for surgery is bubble and bladder dysfunction. So unless bubble or bladder dysfunction is present, we generally don't subject persons with cervical dysplasia or lumbar dysplasia for surgery. So surgery we can do in persons who've got severe deficits like bubble and bladder involvement or who've got structural ab ab abnormalities where we need to surgically repair these ab bony abnormalities. So what are the types of surgery? As I said, we do two types of surgery. One, decompression where we take the disc out, where we take the disc out or disc out or the nerve root, the compression, we remove the compression on the nerve root. The second is the stabilization or fusion of the spinal segments. So discectomy, we have cervical disc prolapse and lumbar disc prolapse. There are two approaches, one anterior approach, two posterior approach. For cervical disc prolapse, since there are not many structures in the anterior compartment, 
For cervical disc prolapse, we generally go for anterior approach. For lumbar disc prolapse, we generally go for posterior approach. So cervical disc prolapse, it is the anterior approach for discectomy. For lumbar disc prolapse, we do discectomy from the posterior approach. But if there is lumbar stenosis where the multiple segments are involved, we have to do a lumbar decompression wherein a lot of segments have to be taken care of because lumbar stenosis many segments get affected it produces neurogenic claudication so person is alright but when he takes few steps he gets severe excruciating pain like vascular claudication but the difference between vascular claudication and neuroclaudication is that vascular claudication as the name suggests it's a vascular uh, compromise whereas neurogenic claudication is because of lumbar canal stenosis where the nerves get compressed so in neurogenic claudication and vasogenic claudication, they get pain after walking a certain distance. We call it a, we call it as a claudication pain. But if it is vascular claudication, there will be symptoms suggestive of vascular compromise, like like pulse being absent. Whereas in neurogenic claudication, there is a symptom suggestive of neurogenic compromise, like absence of jerks, ankle jerk. So when there is lumbar canal stenosis and neurogenic claudication, especially they give they have severe pain when they stand because when they stand these roots get compressed in the narrow lumbar spinal canal but if they bend forwards like bicycling the the there's a gap it gives away and therefore the roots can get decompressed so person always says when they move forward like bicycling the pain gets relieved but when standing and especially after walking for a few for a few uh, uh, meters they get severe pain so here we take a lot of segments into consideration and we do a decompressive surgery right so what are the take home points take home messages one there are c8 roots but c7 cervical vertebra so up to the level of c7 the roots go above the respective vertebral bodies but c8 and below the roots go below their respective vertebral bodies the spinal cord ends at the level of l1 and therefore the spinal cord and vertebral bodies do not correspond to each other the disc prolapse is common in the cervical region and the lumbosacral region but not the thoracic region because the disc prolapse is because of excessive mobility and because there is excessive mobility at the neck and the back we have cervical disc prolapse and lumbar disc prolapse since there is no excessive mobility at the thoracic region, we hardly move thoracic region and in addition it is, get, it is getting protection by thoracic gate, we hardly see thoracic disc prolapse. Thoracic disc prolapse is not common. And if there is a cervical disc prolapse, it can impinge both on the spinal cord and the roots. Spinal cord if it is central and roots if it is lateral, so it can cause myeloradiculopathy. But since spinal cord ends at the level of L1, if there is a lumbar disc prolapse, there is no myelopathy, it can only cause radiculopathy. And as I said, we can try spinal cord stimulation. When we stimulate spinal cord, the posterior column, the large fibers, it closes the gate for the entry of pain impulses to the small fibers. So spinal cord stimulation is an, a very good form of treatment, but it helps only for pain. It actually does not interfere with the pathogenic process of disc prolapse, but it can reduce pain. And the only surgical indication for disc prolapse, the real indication for surgical disc prolapse is bubble or bladder dysfunction. The severe excruciating pain or severe weakness are only relative indications for surgery. By and large, the treatment for disc prolapse is only conservative, medical line of management. For cervical disc prolapse, surgical approach, we go anteriorly because it is easy. There are not many structures, so we can put away all the structures and easily enter the disc space and then do discectomy but for lumbar disc prolapse we go for a posterior approach because there are a lot of structures in the anterior we cannot enter the anterior so we go for a posterior approach and as i said again most of the disc prolapse they recover on their own 80 percent of the time even without treatment so the main approach and treatment whether the cervical disc prolapse or lumbar disc prolapse is only medical 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 and not surgical I hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture and I really enjoyed giving this lecture. Please give your suggestions and comments and please like and subscribe my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts 
and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.